Thank you for downloading this edition of the BBC series The Public Philosopher. The programme is presented by Michael Sandel. Thank you. We're gathered here in London at the LSE for another episode of The Public Philosopher, and today we're going to discuss why vote. I'd like to begin with an experiment. All of you here who are eligible to vote in the forthcoming European and local elections, please stand up. Now, uh, those of you who are standing, those who are eligible to vote, Raise your hand if you intend to vote in the forthcoming elections. Quite a few hands go up. Now, of those of you who've raised your hands, please sit down. And I want those who... (laughs) Those who do not plan to vote remain standing. The vast majority have sat down, which means this must be a very politically activist audience because only about a third of eligible voters actually do vote in European and local elections. Here, the percentage looks to be quite a bit higher. But there are a few dozen people who remain standing who do not intend to vote. And I'd like to begin with you. Those of you who do not intend to vote What would be your reason? Now, I can imagine two different kinds of reason. You might not vote out of principled protest. Russell Brand recently said that he doesn't plan to vote. He never votes as a protest against the impoverished alternatives as he sees them. Or you might not plan to vote because you don't think it's worthwhile. Perhaps you've made a rational calculus that given your chance of affecting the outcome and how much you care about the outcome, it just isn't rational, isn't worth it. What are your reasons? Who will begin our discussion? Yes. I don't believe any of them. <laughs> you, wait, wait. you don't believe any of them what? What they say. So it, it sounds to me... And what's your name? Ray. Ray, it sounds to me that you're abstaining on principle, out of protest. The experience the last... I mean, I've been eligible to vote for 50 years. They will say something at an election, even if it's in a manifesto or whatever, and it's just never stuck to. I I believe in... So you've given up? You've given up all No. No, I haven't given up. (laughs) I go along to the polls, and I write on the poll slip why I'm not voting. Ah. Do you you write an essay, or do you...? (laughs) (laughs) Not quite an essay, no. (laughs) Fair enough. Who else has a reason? Yes. I uh, studied EU law last year, and I learned about how the European Parliament doesn't really have much power, doesn't have much effect, so I don't see the point. Because you don't think it makes a difference, really? Well, I learned extensively about how much it doesn't make a difference. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let me hear one or two other reasons of those who are not voting, then we're going to hear from people who disagree. Yes, in the very back, in the balcony. To make a really valuable and important vote, you need to have a really good political understanding. And I've never studied politics. I did social anthropology at LSE 10 years ago, and I've never studied politics. So although I read about it, I don't understand it well enough. And what's your name? Juliet. Juliet. You say that you don't feel that you know enough about politics to vote. What would you say about most voters? I respect... Everybody who feels that they know enough to vote. (laughs) Um, But I'm not convinced that most of them do. Do you think citizens have an obligation to inform themselves sufficiently to be well-qualified voters? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you do. Thank you for that. One of the things that strikes me about the reasons we've heard so far for not voting is that they are all quite high-minded reasons. No one has said that he or she is not voting out of apathy. How come? (laughs) You're prepared to confess. 
If I'm honest, uh, it's a combination of realizing that every other time local elections have come around, I've always found something else that's just a little bit more important and a little bit more burning and a little bit more pressing for me to do on the day. Such as? Generally, interesting lectures to go to. <laughs> Maybe a good, uh, good afternoon with some friends in a pub. Any of those sorts of things. I was afraid likely. you were going to say cleaning your garage. Uh, no, I, I'm pretty apathetic about cleaning the garage as well, so... <laughs> And push comes to shove, the, the lady's point of earlier, the, the idea that local politics or that uh, European elections, but the idea that my choice will make a huge difference sort of lends itself to the apathy. All right. Now I want to hear from those of you, the majority in this hall, who do intend to vote. You've heard the reasons offered up by the abstainers. What do you think of those reasons? Yes. I think partly that people do have a, a duty as part of a society to vote, but also I think that um, one of the reasons for voting is that for every person that doesn't vote, there's a lot of people with pretty unpleasant ideas that are voting. By not voting, it doesn't mean nobody gets in. People will get in, so it's best that uh, you have a say one way or the other in, in who's going to run you, because by not voting, you're not being unrun. Good. And what's your name? Uh, Michael. Michael. Yeah, a reply. Yes. The woman in the balcony. I think uh, it seems to me some of the people that spoke earlier misunderstand the nature of local politics. It's not about fighting globalisation, your vote next month. It's about local recycling. It's about local children's centres. And in terms of local elections not mattering and not being important, the, I'd say the leader of the uh, local council has, in fact, more power than the MP in terms of how the local budget is spent and what happens and the impact on local people's lives. And tell us your name. Roxanne. Roxanne. Uh, would you say that all eligible voters have a duty to vote in local elections as well as in general elections? Yes, I would. Thank you. Are there others who would like to defend the idea of a civic duty to vote and who have a response to the arguments against voting that we've just heard? Well, the reasons given for not voting, reasons like they never carry out what they promise or like it doesn't matter anyway whether I vote or not and they can, you know, anything will happen anyway. Well, the reason that situation prevails is because we don't go out and vote. If more people were interested, if they knew more people were voting, they would have to honour what they promise. They would have to be more responsive to the electorate. What's your name? Kirsten. Kirsten, what would you say to Colin and Juliet and others who gave principled reasons for not voting? Speak directly. Let's have Colin stand up again. <laughs> and can you well, stand up? Can you stand? Speak directly to Colin. Well, I, when, first of all, I bet Colin doesn't know who his MEP is or even his local councillors. No to either question, yes. But we live in a country where you are completely free to send them an email, ring them, go and see them at surgeries. They are completely accessible to you. You can walk into a town hall. You can walk into Westminster. And I think it is your civic duty to avail yourself of that possibility. There are so many people around the world who do not have this ability, this freedom, and we do. I think the reason these guys are repeatedly getting away with what they're getting away with, which I completely agree with you, is appalling, is because we do not do enough to force them to respond to us. What about that, Colin? Um, I, uh, these, these are grand, high-minded ideals. Maybe I don't have any particular burning issues that I think are big enough for me to need to make the trek down to the, the local MP surgery. I, I lead a fairly comfortable life. I have no major issues sort of burning in my life. As long as I'm largely left alone, I'm, I'm kind of happy and content with myself. So... Well, uh, that, that's fine. But, but uh, make no mistake about it, that won't last unless we carry on honouring our civic duty to partake in our democracy. 
I love the argument. I, I genuinely do. And, and I'm sitting here racking my brain trying to figure out, uh, okay, so uh, next year, the year after, I, I haven't gone to the MP surgery. And my life has changed drastically. How? And what you would like to add to this yeah. debate? I think that if you do go out and vote, it automatically makes you want to know more about what the political parties are doing. The more you get involved and find out what's going on, the more you might seem to realise actually there are problems, not just in your own life either. It's not just if your life's comfortable, that's fine, but we live in a society, so you want to make sure that we as a whole are going to do, do well as well. And what's your name? Dill. I'd like to go back to Kirsten and Dill, who made the case for a civic duty to vote. Now, suppose you're right, that we as citizens have a civic duty to vote. How far should we take this? Should voting be compulsory, Kirsten? In Australia, it is. It's mandatory to vote, and there's a fine, admittedly a small fine, modest fine, about 11 pounds, if you don't vote. Would you like to see voting made compulsory in the UK? Yes, I would like to see voting made compulsory, at least while we have such an appalling turnout rate I think in order to sort of nudge people along, you need to make it compulsory. And so you would say what to Cullen? You would fine him if he (laughs) cleans his garage instead of going to the polls? Yeah, I would. (laughs) Cullen, what do you think? Well, uh, I'd rather you don't. I mean... (laughs) You kind of pointed out that part of the reason why I'm, I'm happy sort of staying out of this whole voting malarkey is precisely because I kind of get left alone to go about managing my own business, leading the nice, comfortable, simple life which I've, I'm kind of enjoying right now. Let's take a poll right here to see, Kirsten, how much support there is for this idea of making voting compulsory. Uh, raise your hand, those of you who would be in favor of that proposal. How many would be against I'd say a modest majority against, but quite a divided house. What's the strongest argument against making voting compulsory? Yes. I'd just like to say that everyone, it's it's like you can own your own life and no one can really like tell you what to do. So if it's your, you can encourage people to vote because voting's a good thing in like a modern society, but you can't be forced because it's your time. You can't be forced because it's your own life. To, to yeah. do with what you want. Yeah. And what's your name? Uh, Sam. Sam. You, do you think compulsory voting would be a violation of your liberty? Yeah. Well, I'm just reading your books. I've just got past libertarianism, so... <laughs> <laughs> in that case, Sam... <laughs> so, In that case, may I ask you a follow-up question? Yeah, you may, you may. may. What about jury duty, service on a jury? You're summoned to serve on a jury. It's mandatory. You don't have a choice not to go. Do you think that's also a violation of your liberty? Uh, um. (laughs) Actually, they're both the same. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm conflicted, I'm conflicted. All right. Fair enough, fair yeah. enough. There's nothing wrong with being conflicted, actually. That's part of serious philosophical reflection. <laughs> Others who disagree with the idea of compulsory voting, what would be your reasons? Yes, I think that if you make it compulsory, it corrupts the entire notion of civic duty. It's supposed to be voluntary. So why would mandatory voting be corrupting? What would it be corrupting of? Corrupting of this, the sense of solidarity... I think there's a sense in which when you perform jury duty, you are together with your fellow citizens and you're working together towards a common end. If someone comes to you and says, well, you know, we're forcing you to do this, um, you don't approach it with the same spirit, I don't think. We've heard from those who consider voting to be a civic duty and we've heard from others who see voting as a matter of personal choice, an expression of liberty. What about the argument that voting is actually inconsistent with reason? Because even if you care about the outcome, if you consider the likelihood, the actual probability that your vote will make the difference, 
and you discount the value to you of your preferred outcome by the chance that your vote will actually make the difference, it's vanishingly small. Is there someone who would like to address the question of whether it's rational to vote? What would you say? Well, it's, it's rational if you define voting as um, freedom of expression. So it's not about necessarily making a change. It's about making your voice heard. Because the point is that I've, I've had my say, and that surely that has value in and of itself. And what's your name? Catherine. Catherine, so you think the act of voting has a kind of expressive significance. It's a form of speech, of expression, quite apart from its instrumental importance in changing the outcome. Yeah, it's intrinsically valuable. Is there someone who would like to address Catherine's argument, someone who disagrees with Catherine about the rationality of voting? Yes. I think the way I'd see it as rational is that is the whole reason I, vo I would vote is because I'm part of a larger community. And it's not the fact that my specific individual vote counts. It's the fact that even the act that I vote will influence people around me. So it's not the fact that me saying yes once to something will actually turn the tide. It's the fact that me saying yes is the same as then 50 people saying yes for the same reason I'm doing. And suddenly that does make a difference. What's your name? Anna. Anna, Anna, could I ask you your view about a scenario I once heard about? There were two American professors who were on sabbatical leave in the south of France on an election day in the U.S. The only way they could cast a postal ballot was to travel four hours by car to the nearest consulate or embassy to vote. One of them was a Democrat, the other was a Republican. <laughs> they both knew that their votes would can that each of their votes would cancel out the other. And yet the two of them got in a car, drove four hours, <laughs> voted, and drove all the way back four hours. Do you think that was rational? In a mathematical sense, no. Thank you for that. Is there someone who disagrees with the rationality of voting understood in strictly economic terms or individualist rational terms, weighing costs and benefits? Is there someone who disagrees with the idea that voting is rational? What would you say? I'll go a, a, a bit of a different direction here. Um, if we think in terms of game theory, you vote because you think if you don't vote, enough people also not voting might mean that your vote is significant. So you vote on the possibility that it might be significant. Now, I don't vote because I think it's rational, and I don't subscribe to that theory. I believe in a social contract, and that's why I vote. But that could be a rational reason for voting. What do you think about my story of the two professors? Did they, were they acting rationally? Well, in that, what if they hadn't gone together and one of them had decided to go? Then their votes wouldn't have cancelled out and he could have just as easily lied to his friend and said he wasn't voting. <laughs> one, one secretly <laughs> slipped out <laughs> and took the four-hour journey by himself. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> Let's extend this cost-benefit analysis of voting one step further. Let's imagine that a politician offers me a bribe of 200 pounds to vote for him or her. Is that morally objectionable? How many would say yes? Almost everyone? No? How many would say no? <laughs> a handful of people, eight or nine people say no. Let me hear from one of you. <laughs> yes, second row. I answered yes and no, because <laughs> um, if you take the bribe, the person's not actually going to look at how you vote. Uh, you can vote against him just because you, <laughs> you think what he's doing is wrong. <laughs> so, I mean, take the money and vote however you want. And you should vote <laughs> against him because he's wrong. What's your reason? The reason you're voting for someone in the first place is because the benefit they're going to bring you, what they're promising you. 
It's just another promise that that politician is making to you. Aha. Uh-huh. So, and what's your name? Rob. So in principle, Rob, are you suggesting that a 200-pound bribe is no different, really, than a politician offering me, say, a 200-pound tax cut or benefit worth 200 pounds to me? It's the same. And since appealing to my pocketbook, my self-interest, my desire for the 200-pound tax cut or benefit, since that, you think, is morally okay, common part of electoral politics, so should be a bribe. Well, Rob has made a radical suggestion. (laughs) But he does have a certain logic to it. Who disagrees with Rob? Yes. Deciding to vote is a moral decision, not an economic decision. So using the cost-profit logic in that situation doesn't apply. You should be using moral logic, which is about what's right and wrong, and not about how you get the most profit out of the situation. And what's your name? Leah. Rob, what do you say to Leah? Leah, if you were to vote for a candidate, one who said that they would promise to keep X number of jobs in your town that would remain you employed, the other who is promising to pass a free trade treaty that would reduce those same number of jobs from where you lived, which one would you vote for? Is that not the same principle of self-benefit? It's an economic decision. Uh, For me, voting is a lot more than self-benefit. So I don't purely vote on what is going to make me the most money. So you think that the politics of self-interest, pocketbook politics, is morally illegitimate, Leah? I would not agree with that. Would you say it's a kind of bribe? Absolutely, yeah. And so, interestingly enough, Leah, you agree with Rob's premise that, morally speaking, a campaign promise to cut my taxes by 200 pounds or to give me a benefit worth 200 pounds is morally on a par with a bribe. The only difference between the two of you is Rob says they're both okay and Leah says they're both morally illegitimate. What do you think? I would say the problem wrong with bribery is that it's outside the system. Part of the system of politics, I think, is to enrich the citizens that sign up into it. And if the system is used by a politician who gets into power to do that, I think that's fine. But I think when the politician goes outside the system and takes a shortcut to get directly to his citizens, takes money out of his own wallet to pay them, he can use a superior position of wealth to get his own way. So, and what's your name? Nat. Nat. So you see the moral difference between a bribe and a campaign promise appealing to economic self-interest in the fact that the bribe comes out of the politician's pocket, not from the public treasury. But why doesn't that actually make the bribe better? It doesn't raid the public treasury. The politician is paying for it himself or herself. Because someone with a lot of capital and income could use his wealth to gain votes rather than using a smaller, limited resource, a more equal resource, to gain votes. Yes? I think there's also a difference in that if you vote for a campaign promise, it still has to go through, for instance, Parliament. There's still an element of debate within it. So there's still a chance for others to have a say in it and make it more, like, less of a personal economic interest as opposed to a bribe where there's just self-interest. But from the standpoint of the voter... And what's your name? Julia. You're the voter. A politician offers you a 200-pound bribe. That would be wrong. It would be wrong to take it? Yeah, it would be. And the same politician offers you a 200-pound tax cut or benefit. It would be wrong to take that? It wouldn't be wrong because you'd still be doing this through a democratic process. So your vote would then be pulled together with everyone else's votes and everyone else would then, like as a society, would determine whether or not that particular tax cut is beneficial, is not beneficial. So you're not acting as an individual taking the bribe, you're acting as a member of the community deciding whether or not the tax cut is beneficial. Yes. 
Don't we have enough trouble with rich people uh, influencing politics? We've got people with lots of money b and buying votes on a massive scale, really, that's going on in, certainly across the Atlantic, and it's increasingly true here. People are going to afford to spend money on advertising. If we let people buy votes directly, we're just giving more power to rich people. And this happened in, in Britain in the 18th and 19th century. Election times were times of public drunkenness because candidates gave beer and did all they, they could to influence voters. I mean, but it changed when politics became more about affirming your identity, saying who, you know, what cause you believed in. That's still the case in places like Northern Ireland, which is why more people vote there. But here we've lent, ended up in a system where people are just making purely pragmatic choices of what's best for them. That's the trouble. I mean, p politics is no longer seen about sort of what sort of vision of society you want to implement and support. Tell us your name. Paul. Paul. So you think in a way that democracy these days does tend to be dominated by self-interest. Yeah. But yes. you see that as a kind of corruption of, of democracy itself. Well, I think it's, what has happened is we no longer have major divisions in our society. People don't vote with a sort of identity politics. So in the 19th century, nonconformists voted liberal, and the Tory party was the Anglican church, prayer, all that kind of thing. That's all gone. So when people go to the polling booth, they're not sort of making a statement about who they are, what, what their identity is. Maybe in some cases they still are. I mean, I think class is still an important issue here. But this kind of element has gone from politics. In some ways it's good. We don't want to go back to the sort of violence and strife it engendered. But it does mean that there isn't that same kind of division that people are really concerned to vote. Your two American professors, one of them was probably, I don't know, a, a, a Republican from the South, an evangelical possibly, and the Democrat may have been a Harvard professor from the West Coast, and they were going to, they were go, from the East Coast, they were going to affirm their values. That's what they were voting for. So now our discussion has taken quite an interesting turn because we began by discussing bribery, outright bribery, and most people were against it. But as the discussion here has evolved, a number of people have suggested that a politics of self-interest is really tantamount to a politics of collective bribery. And then people have been pressed to say, well, then what else should democracy be about? And among the answers we've heard is that democracy shouldn't be just about pursuing economic self-interest. It should be about working out a vision of the common good or about the uh, about competing conceptions of the identity of the citizens in relation to political community. Who disagrees with this non-economic theory of democracy? Perhaps some of you th may think it's, it's too high-minded. What would you say to this more ambitious idea of democracy as deliberation about the common good, competing visions of the political community? If you're wealthy and I'm poor, and I don't know where my next meal is coming from, I would much rather have a few thousand pounds from you than the ability to vote. And if I really believe that I'd be better off doing that, why should I not be able to make my own decision? Like, maybe I really want gay marriage to be legal, but more than that, I'd like to be able to feed my kids. So why should I not be able to make my own decision? I question this idea that somehow self-interest is contrary to the common good. It is quite often the case that if you improve the rest of society, my life improves as well. So if I make it so people don't have to steal, I don't have to put a burglar alarm on my house. Some have criticized a purely economic way of thinking about democracy, a cost-benefit way of thinking about democracy. Others have defended it, even to the point of saying all right, maybe there is a continuity, morally speaking, between collective bribery on the one hand and the politics of self-interest on the other. I'd like to test the economic theory of democracy by taking it to its logical conclusion. Is there any reason in principle why people shouldn't be free to buy and sell their votes if they want to? We've heard many people cite the importance of individual liberty, freedom of choice. Some people care very much about the outcome of an election. Other people less so. In local and European elections, the majority typically don't even bother to vote. 
why shouldn't they be free, if they want to, to sell their vote to the highest bidder, a free market in votes? How many would be in favor of a free market in votes? Only about six or seven, eight people. Let's hear first from those of you who would favor a free market in votes. What would be your reason? Maybe there's a possibility for those that don't actually want to vote. If they were to sell it and give it to someone who would, then there'd be less wasted votes. And that can perhaps make more of a difference in elections, and it would mean that parties would get more votes themselves. What's your name? Jack. Jack suggests that if we allowed the buying and selling of votes, there would be fewer wasted votes. That's probably true. Think of all of the votes that are going to be wasted in the forthcoming election. Why shouldn't people who don't much care about voting be able to get some value out of it, Jack? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Who has an answer to Jack? Yes, in the second row. I would assume that the richest politicians would buy all the votes and you would no longer have democracy. What about that, Jack? Well, what if they were sold between voters instead of parties? Um, How are you going to come up with a system where you can stop people beating the system with the most money and buying all the votes? Well, surely it's, it's a person's choice if they choose not to vote. What's the point in then that not contributing to the democracy if they're not going to do it? I, I agree people should be allowed to abstain, but I think I can't see how you can come up with a market for votes which cannot be corrupted. What's your name? Hector. Hector. But if there were a purely free market in votes, are you saying that that market would itself somehow be corrupted or by definition such a market is corrupting of what democracy ought to be? Uh, the latter. Democracy is about everybody having a vote, having a say, and not being coming under the thrall or dictatorship of the richest people who take over and destroy democracy. We all know that in an ideal world, the most perfect form of government is a benevolent dictatorship. But we so far failed to find any benevolent dictators, so we go with democracy instead. <laughs> and you can't have democracy without votes. You'll have votes, though, Jack says. You'll have even more votes, right, Jack? <laughs> well, if votes were marketed, then maybe it's not... They were not economically, but politically, surely, if those that the want to... Sorry, the definition of democracy is that everybody has an individual vote. It belongs to them. What if they don't if want If you to? start giving it away, then it's no longer democracy. In the, back, in, the back, in the back row. The first point comes down to is if you have a vote, you own it. So, for example, if you own a pen, uh, I could sell a pen and nothing could stop me. So if I own a vote and it's in my name, then I should be able to sell that no different to if I own any other particular uh, asset. And then the second thing comes down to is that there is nothing stopping a whole group of people all getting together in exactly the same manner. So consequently, you could have one rich person who could come along and buy votes, but there's nothing stopping 100 relatively speaking, poorer people, all getting together and pooling their resources to buy votes. So it's not necessarily uh, the rich person that always buys the votes. You could have a grouping of uh, less powerful people. But as far as I was concerned, I would just sell my vote to the highest bidder. <laughs> and what's your name? Michael. Michael, I want to take Michael's first argument that says, having a vote is like owning something. It's my vote, just as this is my pen. And just as I should be free to sell my pen or anything else that I own, so I should be free to sell my vote. We heard many people argue against compulsory voting in the name of individual liberty. Why do not more people agree with Michael that I should be free to sell my vote if I want to? Well, your vote is actually the only thing that ensures that you're equal. Like, in the sense, it's the only fundamental thing that ensures uh, equality in a democracy. And if you sell your vote, then you're undermining the equality of the system. Who else? Uh, I'm not sure that votes are the kind of things that can be sold. Um, ownership isn't always that clear-cut. Uh, for example, if you get a prescription for some painkillers, you don't necessarily then have the right to go and sell them on the street. Yeah, what's your name? Stephen. Stephen, why <coughs> do you think that my vote is mine? I can cast it however I wish. It's mine in that sense. Why is my vote not something that I should be free to sell if I want to? I think voting comes along with a lot of other values attached to it. Um, for example, there's the intrinsic value of actually taking part in democracy. 
And this, in a way, goes back to our earlier discussion about whether there's a civic duty to vote. Yeah. Now, I'd like to go back to Kirsten and Cullen, <laughs> who got us going on this question of whether there's a civic duty to vote and whether it should be compulsory. <laughs> Cullen, you've now heard this debate about where the economic theory of democracy based on self-interest, mm -hmm. you having other more important things to do than vote, where it's led, even to the idea that maybe we should have a free market in votes. What do you think about this debate? It feels a little bit sordid. Uh, sordid? Sordid, yes. Why uh, is that? While I'm happy stepping back from uh, an election where I, I don't think my vote's going to make a huge difference, where I, I don't feel very connected to the issues, once we start thinking about things like selling votes, um, I get the very real concern that sorts of people are going to get the sorts of power which I don't think I, I really want them to be getting. And that's not good enough, though, because the, there is a visceral response to the idea that there's something just a little bit ick about selling a vote. It's just... And I'm not quite sure what it is that's driving that sense. Um, We've been wrestling with that yeah. throughout this discussion, in a way. Yes. And when you say there is something sordid about the idea of selling votes, mm. maybe also about equating a bribe to a campaign promise, is what's sordid, and I see why you say it's hard fully to articulate what exactly seems objectionable, do you think it suggests that there's something corrupting of what democracy is all about, if we conceive it in purely self-interested terms? Is that what's at stake? I don't feel confident saying just yet, for sure. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. Kirsten, what do you think? Well, firstly, I don't think a vote is an asset. It's a right. The moment you start monetizing rights you are straying completely away from what we consider as being a pluralistic democratic system. The whole idea about democracy is that everybody is equal. That's the theory, anyway, that we are all equal, which means that if I have no money whatsoever, I can still go and vote. If I have lots of money, I can buy lots of votes. You're then not talking about democracy any longer. When you say that my vote is not an asset, it's a right. Yeah. Some people, we've heard, say, it's my right, and therefore I should be free to sell it if I please. Well, your, your rights in a democracy, your human rights, if you like, belong to your identity. They're attached to you, to your being. My vote is attached to my person. And so would you say that the vote is a right, but also at the same time a duty, and that's why I can't sell it? Yes. It, it is a duty, which is why I want to make it compulsory and fine Colin if he doesn't go and vote. <laughs> We've considered various arguments for and against voting, and these arguments have led us to consider different ideas about what voting is for. And those arguments, in turn have forced us to consider what democracy is all about. One of the striking, I would say even moving, features of this discussion is that if, as we've explored some of the examples and some of the logical implications of this or that view of voting and of democracy, we sometimes find ourselves conflicted, not only disagreeing among ourselves, but sometimes feeling torn within ourselves, which I think, in some ways, shows the power of serious reasoning in public, deliberating together, thinking hard about big questions, and driving really for the underlying philosophical idea at stake. In this case, the question of what democracy is really about. And so, I think what we've learned is that in order to answer the question, why vote? We find ourselves struggling with the question, what is democracy for? What is it about? And we identified at least two competing conceptions of democracy. 
One of them is the idea that democracy is for the sake of adding up people's preferences and interests so that the values and interests and preferences of the majority can find expression in public policy. But that view of democracy, we call it the economic view or the instrumental view of democracy, makes it difficult to distinguish between collective bribery and responding to campaign promises. And that left some people uneasy. The economic theory of democracy also made it difficult, challenging, to explain why not have a free market in votes. And so we found ourselves struggling to articulate a possible alternative to a purely instrumental theory of democracy, connected with giving expression to our collective identity, deliberating about the common good, maybe in ways that lead us to challenge, to rethink the preferences and the interests we thought we had when we entered public life or cast our gaze upon politics and the alternatives it offers. So why vote? Hard to answer that question without delving into the larger philosophical question, what is democracy about? And in some ways, the debate we've had here today is, I think, a pretty powerful illustration of what the deliberative conception of democracy in politics can be. Next week, we go to Asia for a debate among students from Japan, China, and South Korea. But for now, from London, I want to thank you for joining us for this episode of The Public Philosopher. Thank you very much. That was The Public Philosopher, presented by Michael Sandel. The producer was David Edmonds.